everyone, I'm Ioana Negulescu and some of you know me as Berries and Spice. Welcome to the Afternoon Food Show, a space for culinary tales for serious gourmets, a curated digest of food news covering business, art, sustainability, culture and more. In short, I read all the food news so you don't have to and then geek out about it all. In today's edition, I'll be covering the concept of disgust, a winemaking video game, mm -hmm, epicurious topping to post recipes with beef, Flat pasta that gets diverse shapes as it cooks, and by now, you know it, robots. Amongst lots of other topics, as always. We've already talked about the disgust issue uh, when I told you about organ meats in the first episode of the show. Disgust is a big topic that we never seem to talk about enough. It's also this edition's main story. Intrinsically, it's supposed to be an innate reaction to things that could potentially harm us. Think about the fact that the human palate tends to dislike bitter flavors, and that changes with time and experience. That is because back in the days when we were feeding ourselves picking berries and nuts from the forest, usually bitterness meant that something was poisonous. But also, a rotting carcass of some animal leading to the feeling of disgust is probably one of the reasons why our species was not wiped out by food poisoning. But if you move away from our innate reactions of disgust, a lot of what we find disgusting depends on when and where we were born and how we were raised. I told you last time that fried brains were one of my favorite dishes as a child. When I tell that to my British friends, I get instant grimaces of disgust followed by the classic ew. The author of the article mentions the disgusting food museum in Malmö in Sweden, a name that she herself questions because it creates an instant bias that some things should be considered disgusting. Their scoreboard tracks how much time has passed since someone last vomited in the museum. Back in 1872, when Charles Darwin himself studied disgust, he thought it to be a basic human emotion. If people are served a glass of orange juice with a cockroach inside, they say it's disgusting because of the dirty nature of cockroaches, no matter how many times they are told that the cockroach was cleaned and disinfected, writes the author. The article goes on to discuss the cultural implications of disgust and the fact that our aversion towards certain foods places us within a specific cultural system. Think of Islam or Judaism and pork, which is considered to be unclean. But she states another factor too. Across cultures, the elite gravitate towards foods that are inaccessible to the masses, owing to price, scarcity or difficulty of preparation. Giving the example of how the French used to eat ortolans and monkey brains were a delicacy in China. If we follow this same logic, I guess it is somewhat elitist to eat fried intestines in Europe today. Even though there were poor people's food throughout history and still are in some parts of the world, Every time I dig deeper into the food system, I realize just how convoluted it is. But let's get back to the article. The author, a Chinese-American, writes about her experience moving from China to the US and finding things that we eat on a daily basis disgusting, like olives, ravioli or sauerkraut. The opposite is, of course, true with many. Disgusted by foods such as century-old eggs, chicken feet, blood stews, and etc., etc., Probably the line that stuck with me the most, though, was the following. In the 20th century, powerful nations seem to reinvent food by processing the disgust out of it. And indeed, that is so true. Just think about Jamie Oliver's failed experiments with McDonald's chicken nuggets and just how many ingredients considered disgusting go inside. Ground bones, blood vessels, connective tissues, fat. And yet, even when people know about these ingredients, they are still fine with it. Build a brand that revolves around happiness, sprinkle a bit of convenience and stir in millions on dollars spent on advertising. I guess, just like one of my favorite YouTubers said in her latest episode of Philosophy Tube, they say that people are afraid of what they don't understand. But what if people don't want to understand? And we all know that ignorance is bliss. Anyway, this was one of the most interesting reads I've come across in recent months, so I recommend spending half an hour of your time reading the entire article. You'll find the link in the description. Now, speaking of things that we are taught to consider disgusting, ever wondered why insects are not easily found in Europe yet? Well, firstly, they're considered novel foods. This means that their impact on people's health and diet has not been studied 
or approved by European authorities yet. Insects are complex organisms, which makes characterizing the composition of insect-derived food products a challenge. Understanding their microbiology is paramount, considering also that the entire insect is consumed, says Armolaus Ververis, a chemist and food scientist at the European Food Safety Agency. There is another factor, allergies. Since insects are considered such a great source of protein and so many food allergies are linked to protein, this needs to be carefully studied before insects are approved to go onto the European market. Of course, this gets even more complicated because there is such a huge diversity of insect species and they all need to be studied closely. But although there is ongoing research into other types of insects, the European Food Safety Agency officially recognized mealworms as edible at the beginning of the year and they just approved their sale on the market last month. Okay, but you may have come across brands or restaurants that already use insects in food, right? The legislation is a little confusing because while at a European level only mealworms are allowed to enter the market, at a national level, in some cases, insects are allowed. Which is why increasingly more businesses commercialize them. A French chef features insects in all shapes and forms in his tasting menu at restaurant Innovite in Paris. More than that, Chef Laurent Veillet and his team also offer cooking classes for those wishing to learn how to use insects as food. Remember the days when you used to spend hours playing Civ with your friends? We'll forget about those. If you're here, I'm pretty sure you like wine as much as I do. I have always been proud of the fact that I did not fall into the video game trap since I know my obsessions can take up enormous amounts of time. However, things have now changed. Making wine virtually in a super exciting and detailed game is the new thing. 100 Days by Broken Arms Games bridges the gap between video games and wine. I surely didn't know there was a gap to be bridged, but I am embracing it with open arms. In the game, the players get to produce their own vintage of Barbera or Chardonnay, following detailed processes, and then sell it to interested customers so they can expand their wine business. And if that works successfully, the players get to expand with more great varieties, farming tools, more vineyards, different strains of yeast, casks, and more. The only downside is that you will not get to taste the wine, but be sure to drink some as you play. Working on this episode has kept me away from actually trialing the game, but I promise I'll review it in a future episode, so stay tuned and make sure you subscribe to my channel to get notified when new videos are up. Now, interrupting this serious program with this month's features. This episode's art piece is a self-portrait by Sarah Lucas, one of the many self-portraits the photographer took between 1990 and 1998. This edition's song is Orange Juice by Stanley Brinks and the Wave Pictures. You can find more food and drink themed songs in my Spotify playlist, Gastronomy Music. I'll leave a link in the video's description. The ingredient of the month goes to ba -ba 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 -ba, acacia flowers. They are such a fabulous and fragrant ingredient, and this is their season. You can fry them in batter, use them to make fermented drinks similar to sparkling elderflower, syrups, jams. I just love to ferment them in sugar water with a little yeast, bottle that, then keep that in the fridge with a little extra sugar to get the drink fizzier. Forget about Hugo and whatnot, acacia spritzers for the win. In other news, the recipe website Epicurious announced that they are removing recipes featuring beef from their website in an effort to support sustainable eating. Epicurious is one of the most high traffic recipe sources on the internet. Therefore, their influence on consumers is paramount. But by now, it is common knowledge that industrial beef production has a huge environmental impact, unless you watch Fox News and other similar media outlets, which will just blame China for it all. Epicurious is an American publication with its largest audience in the US. And the US is also the largest cattle producer in the world. But a country where industry lobbying is prevailing, how can you drive change? Well, through education. But educating the masses is extremely challenging too. So isn't it easier to just reduce consumers' exposure to meat in order to reduce its consumption? Thank you, Epicurious, for setting a great example. This month came with more mindful food consumption news from the States. Daniel Holm and his team at 11 Madison Park are giving up meat altogether. In fact, they are embracing a plant-based approach with small exceptions such as milk or honey for coffee or tea. 
an institution long known for the technical proficiency of dishes featuring suckling pig, sea urchin, and lavender glazed duck will reopen with a menu free of meat and seafood, reads the New York Times article. But Daniel Holmes' efforts towards a more sustainable food system do not stop here. Every meal consumed at 11 Madison Park will also contribute with five meals to 11 Madison Truck, a project built in partnership with NGO Rethink Food that aims to provide food to those in need. And since we're on the topic of sustainability, did you know that there is a machine that turns stale bread into tiny crumbs that can be reused to make new loaves? The crumbs are then mixed in with regular flour to make bread, cookies, cakes, and more. According to Business Insider, about 10% of bread is wasted in France, simply because there is too much of it. That happens despite France's government's efforts to stop supermarket food waste. Before I spend 2,000 euros on the crumbler, however, I will just blend my stale bread finely and start my own batch of repurposed bread to make more bread. I'll let you know how that goes. There are so many things we can all do to reduce waste. A group of researchers designed flat pasta that turns into different pasta shapes when it cooks. Okay, okay, what does this mean? And why does it matter? And how exactly does it work? Let me unpack this for you. Most pasta types like macaroni, fusilli, farfalle and others require a substantial amount of packaging simply because they cannot be packaged ergonomically. Almost like your bags of crisps that contain 30% air or something. By having flat pasta that molds itself into various shapes when it cooks, you can save up on the packaging needed and therefore waste less of it. Now, how does it work? The pasta comes with growth patterns that influence the final shape. This same technique could be applied to flour or gel-based foods like noodles or gelatin desserts. If you thought flour carrot garnishes were outdated, just you wait for pasta flowers and more. But what is kitsch without art and art without food? Food has always been a central theme in art. Now art is central to food too. The Uffizi galleries in Florence have started a new show where they invite chefs to prepare dishes based on the art in the museum. This theme is becoming increasingly more popular. Los Angeles County Museum of Art featured a series with the same idea. The documentary Ottolenghi and the Cakes of Versailles is a reinterpretation of an 18th century French um, cooking, all happening at the Met. In episode one, we talked about pizza toppings. I mean, Italy is known for its rather conservative views on cooking. As the rebel pizza maker I mentioned I was in the first episode, I uh, have my position. But here's something crazy that even a non-conformist cook could find exciting. Well, that is, if you're a cook passionate about the ingredients you use in the food you make. A handful of politicians are proposing a law to ban the production of bad quality gelato. That is, gelato made with artificial flavoring, synthetic dyes, or hydrogenated fats. Non-compliance to the standards of gelato making could lead to fines of up to 10,000 euros. On the other side of Italian food conservatism, I will just leave you with this. If you thought I was done with cultural scandals revolving around food, I've got news for you. Across the English Channel, the Cornish got pissed at Sainsbury's supermarket for screwing up the order of toppings on a scone. The debate amongst Brits can get heated when it comes to what's first, clotted cream or jam. And every Cornish person will say it's jam. So in British fashion, Sainsbury's apologized for adding the clotted cream below the jam. But this is not all. Sainsbury's committed two food crimes because in Cornwall, fruit scones are served with butter only, not cream and jam like in the Sainsbury's ad. And remember when Jamie Oliver offended the Spanish for creating a paella valenciana that wasn't traditional at all? Well, now there's a robotic arm that can make paella without the need of any sort of human intervention, ready to upset all paella purists. The engineer and entrepreneur said he had been surprised at how good the finished dish was, right down to the crunchy crust, or socarrat, uh, when he first tried it. The article reads, The robotic arm developed by Mimico and Beer Robot 5 can cook rice for now, but has a lot more cooking potential, like making fries or flipping burgers. Of course, there are three camps in this whole debate. The purists who cannot entrust a robot to make proper traditional food, 
The robot skeptics who are scared of the fact that robots will eventually take over our jobs, and of course, those who already see the endless opportunities. No offense to anyone, but it's not like anyone is truly passionate about flipping burgers at McDonald's. I mean, just saying. But here's an interesting fact to those of you who are scared that robots will take over our jobs. As more robots are being used to do a variety of jobs, a new workforce is created. The need for human monitoring is essential, especially in a setting like that of a restaurant where the robot waits tables. AI is still limited and there are times when robots mishandle a task or get confused. This is where this new workforce comes into play. So all in all, robots are not taking over our jobs, but they may indeed turn us into couch potatoes. I hope you've enjoyed today's episode, and if you did, like it, subscribe to my channel, and follow me on Instagram for daily food stories. But until next time, what's the one thing you would definitely not want a robot to be able to cook? You know where to leave that comment. Tschüss!